Welcome to the podcast. This one is with Harry Dillon. You might remember Harry from Holby City, uh, but he's also gone on to star in uh, brilliant West End plays and uh, Broadway theatre as well. Uh, he is, he's in London. He's a dad. He's got a couple of kids, got his missus. And um, and actually, we end up speaking a, a lot about fatherhood, um, more so than I, I intended to. But that's the brilliant thing about this podcast is that um, we kind of just have a conversation with with brilliant people. And he is brilliant. You'll hear how articulate he is, how much he thinks about him as a dad and his role with his kids and what he tells them, what he teaches them. Um, and also his own father. Naturally, we reflected on our, our dads and, and the kind of the way in which they influence us acting, where things are going, the way roles are being cast nowadays. Um, this is a brilliant chat with, with a brilliant guy, a super talented guy. This is Harry Dillon on the Tommy Sandu podcast. You're going to like this one. Ta-da! How are you? Ta-da! How are you? I feel like it, it, I'm good. I think it, it, it needs an actor's entrance, so it needs a ta-da. It needs a ta-da. Yeah. Here yeah, I know, right? Wah. Jazz oh, hands. Yeah. All, all, all actors need that. I, I imagine that everything in your life is theatrical and OTT. And, everything and, is and always this. jazz hands all day long, yeah. right? It's all sparkles you, and sunshine. Of course. And I, I bet your family clap as he walks into the room and leaves the room. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful dinner performance there, Dad. Great effort. At the... <laughs> yeah, look, I'm laughing because I, you, I know you, you know, you're not the star at home. You could be the star on telly. You might be the star on stage. You might be the star in a film. <laughs> look at you, the way you shake. You look. All of a sudden, now I feel like you're like a broken man. Like Tommy, you don't realize they don't appreciate. Tommy, you don't even me. realize. Yeah, I'm the villain in my own in my own home. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like the bad cop. I'm always the bad cop. Yeah. You're like who? <laughs> Who cast this role for me? I didn't even I didn't even audition for this. What what? <laughs> They're like some roles, you know, some roles are just meant to be. That's what it is. I know it's, it's always like it's like, wait, wait. So everything I do is lame? Everything? Is that possible? <laughs> My daughter assures me, she's like, Yes, everything you do is lame. Just stop. Uh, what what have you got remind what have you got daughters, kids, kids wise? Or how many how many are there in the Dylan clan? Uh, there's two. I have a daughter who's 15 now. Um, and my boy is 10, soon yeah. to be 11. That straight away. Now I've got two boys, a nine and a five, but I know a 15 year old daughter or like I've got nieces and, and, and close yeah. to my nieces is a different game from a 15 year old boy, let alone a 10 year old boy. That's you're almost running two software. It's like, you've got a Samsung and an iPhone, different <laughs> software, different <laughs> updates at different times. And you got to know how to manage all yeah. your data files across the two. And the great thing is that the, neither one of those two software systems speak to each other. So, like, <laughs> you know, so she'll look at Which him is, like, "What's going on here?" And he'll look at her like, "Why is what? What? Why? Why?" <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> they just but, don't speak but, at all. Isn't it funny? You know, both created by you and your wife. Well, I pre I presume yeah. you don't know. You don't know. Well, you, I don't even know if you know. I don't know if you've had the tests, but I'm just saying. I'm yeah, exactly. Presuming. I mean, I'm just going on faith right now. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, isn't it funny how, how differently they turn out? And it's almost become a cliche as to like, oh, my two kids are so polar opposite. And are they, are they very different in that way? Yeah. It's almost, uh, you know, the, the irony is that they look, they look very similar. Right. Very similar, but that is the only bond I think that kind. And they have a similar; they do have a similar sense of humor, but in every other way, they are totally different. My daughter is very studious. My son is not so much. He's kind of very creative. My daughter as well. They're kind of like the yin and yang of each other. I was yeah. going to tease, and I was like, "Man, if I could smash you guys!" Because of course, we always play the game like, "Which one is your favorite? Which one is your favorite?" I'm like, "Well, if I can put you two together, <laughs> yeah, create a hybrid." Then, uh, then we get yeah, the perfect but, child. In, individually, no, neither of you. Neither of you. I'm, yeah. I'm disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> but, Which one of you is my third favorite? <laughs> so I don't know whether I've I've picked this up from somewhere or whether I've made it up, um, but I've got a theory on why they end up so different. And I think, yeah. okay, I didn't know if you, okay, I was going to hear what you, I don't know if you had a theory on it as well, but I, I think it's a survival thing. I think it's an animal thing meaning you're creating a tribe, you're creating a survival tribe, going back to our animal instincts, you can't have, you wouldn't want to have two members of your team with the same skill set. You need a striker and a defender. You don't need two strikers, you know. So I think they end up different almost biologically as a human 
something written into our DNA survival code thing. What do you think, Harry Dillon? I like it. I think you're right. I have a I have another version of that idea, but I think you put it better. Mine is is that nature abhors a vacuum. So if there's a role, let's say that one child is playing and playing quite well, right? There's another space that's available. And so that other child will kind of naturally gravitate to it to kind of say, see, I do this. You'll notice me for this. So, uh, okay. you know, with my daughter, she was kind of very kind of just like academically inclined off, off her own back, let's say. Right. And I think my boy unconsciously, I would imagine, kind of picked another kind of thing that he could kind of claim as his own. So everyone kind of like finds their natural space, which is you say it in a better way. I think you're right. No, I like yours because yours almost says that they they come out in the world and they're kind of going, hang on a minute, where's where can I put my shop? Because I don't want to do yeah. an I don't want to be another iPhone. I'm gonna go set up Android down the road a little bit and, totally. and, and get a different market. I like that. Yeah. No, yeah. But then that go, that then goes down the theory of nature versus nurture that they are they are adapting to nature that they are not. It's not predetermined, and he's he has come out yeah. adapting to his world. Yeah, I think I think there's a point in that. I mean, recently I've been kind of talking to um, my daughter about this, especially. You have like the the I've been thinking about this well. The idea of the, the bond between nature versus nurture. There isn't there is nature, of course, but then the nurture becomes um, it's small but significant. I think in that. It's funny, I was talking to my daughter, it's like, you know, as she's kind of becoming a teen, she is a teen. I said, like, you have this idea of the way things should be. And I think my job as a parent to show you how things are, like why it's important that you get up at such and such time, why it's important you make your bed or straighten your, because the little things become the big things, you know, in some ways. So that's kind of my little, that's, that's, the, that's the version I'm using right now to justify everything, you know. Um, but I think that's the, that is kind of, that's what I'm noticing, particularly with, with her, she kind of like reaches that because, you know, the, whole, the game is all the same, right? We're trying to like launch these people into so that they're kind of like kind, humble, serving human beings in the planet. Right. That's yeah. that's really yeah. it. So what yeah. are the aspects that make that, you know? But then don't you sometimes and I don't know how you are. Maybe I'm questioning myself when I say this is I'm still bloody working it out. So who am I to tell you? And, and I end up presenting a lot of options to my kids like you. You could make your bed. You might not make your bed. If you don't make your bed, nothing bad's really going to happen. But you're going to come back home and your bed's not made. And then, you know, I said, and then your homework's not quite done. And your handwriting's not quite neat enough. And then you don't quite make the grade. And you don't quite get the job. And you just, and but then I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I've tried to, I'm always struggling with how far do you go with that? Because, and again, as an actor, and I'm sure, you know, I'm not saying I'm the same, but as I suppose just as an, an analysis of life, you're kind of, you're trying to work out what the best options are. You're always looking at options. So I don't know. I don't know how many of those you relay back, you, you pass on to your kids or whether you just leave it be and go, ah, you're no, I think you're right. I mean, I, I take your first point, especially like, you know, like I've had this conversation with them as well. I was like, wait, 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 who, who told you what, at what point did you have the idea that like, I'm holding all the answers and I'm just dispensing them one at a time to you in some predetermined order. I say, like, wait, we're all making this up as we go along. <laughs> you know, we're all doing this together. And it's funny, I've been doing the same thing with my daughter. My, we live relatively close to her school, but not close enough for her. She's always kind of angling for a ride. And I, I kind of did it a couple of times, right? I gave her a ride, I was like, yeah, it's rainy, whatever, I'll give you a ride, I'll drop you off. Well, then that became like, like she was getting up later and later. And one day she's like, I'm really late. I, I need a ride. I'm like, and then you have to wear it. And you have to walk. He said, well, what am I going to do? I was like, you're going to walk in. You can say, I woke up late. And, and, and we got, into, we got into this idea of like, honestly owning what you've just done. I was like, you, you woke up late because you went to bed late. You went to bed late because you were talking to your friends on the phone. That's your, that's the consequence of your choice. I'm not going to pull you out of this one. It's a tiny one. Right. But yeah, but also okay. I just didn't feel like taking her. <laughs> that, that, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you justified it in the lesson. Uh, well done. No, but, but, but it's that it, it that is that whole thing of like when they fall over, letting them fall over. They're kind of playing on something. You think oh, it's a bit they're a bit precariously balanced on the edge of that thing, and that you can you can see the accident happening. You can you know she's going to be late, and you can either put a plaster over it and go, "I'll get you there on time, Daddy." Yeah. Super Harry, Daddy will fix everything, or yeah. go, "Nope." 
this is part of it. And, and therefore, don't we all need to just fall down sometimes? Don't we all just need to rock up late sometimes? Is is there? You're saying that's a yeah. relevant lesson. Yeah, no, I I was going to say, it's like, you know, I'm putting the question to her now. It's like, well, what kind of person do you want to be? Who do you want to be? It's kind of up to you. I don't have like, I don't, it's like, I don't own that anymore. You know, I, I like my, my, like the bandwidth I have to kind of like control some of that is like going like this. Right. And hers is ever increasing. So I'm like, these, some of these decisions are up to you. You have agency in your own life in some ways. Like, and as I told her, I was like, now the reason I'm not taking you to school this morning is because I kind of don't feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to what extent then, uh, if you don't mind me asking this, because I, I say this about myself all the time, do you feel like you're playing dad because you are an actor and you are aware of what's required in certain roles? Um, you will research those roles. You will do your homework for that particular character. I feel like I'm still a kid in so many ways. I am lazy. I will take shortcuts. I don't want to do stuff like this. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to hit the, the gym. But I, mm. I kind of, I'm playing the role of, well, listen, I'm out there in the public. I want to get my feel good on. I want to be motivational. I want to be inspired. So I'm playing my role. Are you playing dad to some extent? Yeah, I think well, in some, on some level, we're always going to do it. I tell you what, I tell you one thing I have noticed is uh, from like, I'll be doing theatrical training. And obviously a lot of being an actor is understanding the psychology of what motivates us as human beings or an individual. Sometimes I become really aware of how a message is going to play. Like if I want, let's say, let's take this previous example. If I want her to start waking herself up earlier in time, like I'll kind of know like how, at what point and when and how a certain message can be heard. I think that's always the big thing you're trying to find as an actor in some ways. Like how am I going to make the other character, the audience, wh whoever, the person across on the other side of the TV, listen to the thing that I'm going to say, right? And what are the devices you can kind of use? So you be kind of become very aware. I, I, I'm aware of that from time to time. But for sure, playing dad, yeah, <laughs> I think I think we're always kind of playing some role, completely. And then in the same way, playing husband, playing son, playing brother, playing you know, it's it's there are there are there are certain situations that require different things from us. And I and I'm not just throwing this in for the sake of throwing it in. It's very it's an obvious way to take this conversation is being of Asian origins. You know, there's a certain way to kind of play your kind of desi side and not play it you know so it's 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 there's a there's a dance isn't there there's a dance to life and we we you move you got to move accordingly it's funny you said my mom always used to kind of especially when i was younger you know when i grew up in i grew up in california and uh at the time there were there weren't many indians around yeah i mean not many not many at all in fact i think i was a teenager before i met another one that i wasn't related to i'm actually kind of not kidding <laughs> and, um, and, I, I, I would just uh, want to be there at that moment when you saw each other. Like, hey, are you, are you, you're like another brown guy? What? You got to embrace each other. <laughs> when I came to old. London, the first time I came to London in, in the mid '90s, I was visiting. I came through or early '90s. I was visiting. But I remember kind of just going through. I, I may have been South Hall. It could have been Brick Lane. And obviously, there's a huge Asian. But I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> Do all these Asians know these Asians are here? It yeah. blew my mind. That, it totally blew my are mind. Are you all one family? Are you all one family? Yeah. What's, what's, what's that then? That's brilliant. Yeah. So, now, you, of course, so you're the only one in California. In the, yeah. And now, of course, it's totally different, right? There's a massive community. Of course, there's like everywhere in the world. But, it, you know, at the time, my mom used to say to me, like, oh, you're, you, you're always just trying to take the best of both worlds. You're trying to take the best at like whatever suits you and benefits you at any point. I was like, well, yeah, isn't that the point? I was like, yeah, wouldn't that be, does that make sense? I said, I don't even know, like, why wouldn't you? Why would you not take the best or or the things that benefit you? Probably is more accurate. The things that benefit you more uh, uh, from your Asian cultural heritage and some of the freedoms and other cultural choices and benefits you get from the West or the States or California or wherever it might be, of course. Yeah. And that surely is is evolution. Pick and choose. You pick, pick bits, you roll on, you know, the little... If you, I'm going down the avalanche route now, like it's a snowballing and the snowball gets bigger, but it becomes stronger and forms picking up on whatever it's, whatever it is you're going through. Well, I don't know how you grew up as well, but certainly when I was growing up, there was a real, um, I, there was a palpable uh, awareness from my parents of retaining some aspects, aspects of our Indian culture, right? In some way, shape or form. And like, I, I can see how from their perspective, everything is, um, 
you know, oh, well, if he likes hamburgers more than he likes rotis, what does that mean for the future? Is it going to be like, what's it going to be like, right? All, all, all of these things together. These days, we don't have so much of that. Like, I don't have so much of it. I do think of it from time to time. You know, my, my children are like every, it seems like every child right now, right? They're kind of, they're half English, half, half Indian, right? So, and I've noticed with uh, uh, something that happened with me, but it's happening to my children quite naturally because they live in, in a Western culture and they, they seem to naturally kind of like gravitate to the, 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 the Indian parts of their background, right? Like we go to India fairly, you know, frequently. We, go, you know, they obviously are very close to, you know, my mom and everyone in, you know, in California and stuff like that. So there's part of that fear that is, gone out, out out of that i think for me and i think that's probably where what what my mom and dad were saying without knowing that they were saying like what's going to happen you know they were first generation my mother and father you know they grew up on a farm in india mm -hmm. come to the states and you know in california and like in the 70s right like on the on, under the hangover of you know the summer of love and you know we're kind of like Woodstock. very <laughs> Woodstock yeah. in a very permissive society all of these things. And I remember kind of culture, like where we kind of grew up, they must have just been like, what have we <laughs> stepped into? Like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, sorry, on that, so, you know, you know, the 70s and 80s, you know, that West Coast America would have changed so much from hippiness to kind of, you know, I'm talking about drug culture, property, you know, pop culture, MTV, TV, the, 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 you know, all of that. Yeah. They they went through a blooming roller coaster, really, didn't they? To, of, of a a that. real roller coaster, yeah. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, in some ways, because we were the only Indians really around, and because you have like the hangar of the '60s, and like a lot of the the uh, you know, and, uh, particularly San Francisco, particularly the Bay Area at the time, uh, uh, you have the the cultural infiltration of let's say uh, Indian philosophical thought. So in some ways, we were becoming fetishized, right? People are like, oh, these are our Indian friends. You know? <laughs> so it became kind of a key card. Like, totally, right? You're absolutely right. It became kind of a key card until I kind of, uh, I remember my mother and father would get invited to dinner parties and, and alongside people, and people would kind of come over, and we would have chats, and there would be all kinds of different people uh, who grew up in the area. My father was an electrical engineer. Uh, at the time, he became very good friends. I forget what this guy's name. And I'll, I'll never forget him. I was really small. He had a huge afro. And kind of these Malcolm X glasses on this black leather jacket. And anyway, we're kind of talking. And there's a picture of a really kind of a picture that's burned in my head from with him and my father. He, he kind of came over. And, and at one point, my dad just mentioned something. I started kind of like piecing. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He, he was a Black Panther. Yeah. He was like, yeah. I was like, well, you know who they were. He's like, yeah, yeah, because well, they're you know they had the Black Muslim Bakery just up the road from where I used to work in the machinist shop, and you know he worked there as well, and so we would kind of hang. So we kind of had, and at the same time, he was also very good friends with a uh, a very kind of conservative, small C conservative back when like Republican meant like Ronald Reagan, not Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, he was also friends with uh, a very prominent local lawyer, so we'd go there. So they, we became kind of like. You were able to kind of move through different parts of that Californian West Coast American society, almost unfettered in some ways. That's that would have been such a mishmash of a world. Think about that. Think about your dad, but you know, Punjabi, like you say, yeah. come from the end. Yeah, over there, hanging out with Black Panthers. Do you know what I mean? Like, in 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 that amazing, in that beautiful, in a way, isn't that kind I of like? Think it was incredible. You know, I kind of appreciate both of their lack of not not even. Not la non judgment for one another. Like in some level, clearly they were looking at each other as people. Whether my dad knew or not that he was a Black Panther, even what that probably meant, he may not even <laughs> even have known. To be perfectly honest, you know. Yeah. And I remember like some yeah. really interesting. Again, I was too young to kind of take on the full the 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 you know the the weight of their conversation or the depth of their conversation. But I always remember kind of quite uh, uh, interesting conversations going on with them around. I don't know the role. I, I suppose, in some ways, like the role, what what their roles were within the society that they were living. It was an interesting time to kind of grow up and see. Yeah. So I just had visions of your dad saying, "Oh, Kali trouser pon da." What? Yeah. Black <laughs> Panther. 
<laughs> oh, black. Oh, they got black <laughs> panther. Yeah. Oh, they got jean <laughs> panther. Yeah. And all that. No, dad, dad, no, you, you've misunderstood the whole panther thing completely. Um, <laughs> uh, man, I, the one thing I remember, but we had a piano, a stand up piano downstairs, and he was, my dad was showing him. I, God, I really wish I could remember his name. He was showing around the house. It was the first time he came over. I was kind of trailing behind him. And uh, there was a, a light that sat on top of the piano. And uh, it it was like a harp light. It had like little strings on it. So it was like a little kind of, you know, just a little curiosity. I remember the guy was like, he's like, man, I really like your light. And my dad was like, it's not for sale. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to buy it. I was just telling you. Like, no, don't yeah. look at my light. Hands off. Yeah. And then we went up the stairs. I remember we walked up the stairs. And I remember the, this gentleman, he, he took it two stairs at a time. And I just remember thinking like, man, I did not know you could do that. You couldn't go two stairs up at a time. <laughs> this guy's making progress. This, is, this guy's moving. He's, I want to be this guy. I want to be a two-step Dylan. That's what I want to be known as. Yeah, you know, like, I just blew my mind. I was like, wait, 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 wait. You can take stairs two at a time? Yeah, <laughs> I love that. It's, it's the little things in life. On just on the on the because you said about you know your dad and fatherhood and all that, and I didn't expect us to talk about this for this much time. But before I ask about your dad, no, no, let's go with it. Your dad first. When, when, mm. when you think of what legacy he left for you, or what he's passed on to you, what the messages are for you um, from him. Um, mm. What are they? And therefore, the part, the second part of that is when you think about your kids and all the little things that you're teaching, making your bed and this, that, and the other, and and homework and and lessons in life. How do you want to be remembered? So, because I think the way in which you want to be remembered is is the way in which. Sorry, you know, sorry, I don't even know. Is your dad still in your life? Is he around? Is he, no, he no. My dad died in 2000, uh, 2015, early two thousand fifteen. Okay, okay, right. No, no, so it, it, his time had come. His right, time had come. Okay. Um, so, uh, so what what was his well, you know, what would you say? My, my dad's here. He's, he's still he's around, around the corner, 74, 75 yeah. years old. But he's taught me loads about, I suppose, about, a lot about patience, a lot about um, consistency, seeing things through mm -hmm. to the end, you know, uh, loyalty. He, he's, my dad's never um, done anyone over, you know, like in, a, in yeah. that sense. He doesn't get involved in people's lives. Like that. Actually, he keeps a distance from certain things. Like he's not He's not a mad sports person. He hasn't got any kind of mad, you know. So he's he's just been solid and consistent. He's had my back. I describe it as a hand on my back that's there, but you can't feel it. So if you're dropping, you're like you'll go. All right, I got you, but he's it's not pushing you along either. And he's always yeah. been quite. So all these little things I get from him, um, and I wonder what you've got from yours, and therefore what you want to pass on because a lot of those I want to pass on to my kids. So. Well, I think it's very similar to what you're talking about. I, I mean, the way I'd always kind of describe my father is that he kind of gave, or not just me and my sister, but our entire kind of extended family, uh, it, he was the philosophical underpinning uh, of, uh, of everyone. So I think he kind of gave us a real sense of uh, um, a, a, an understanding of not what the answers were, but what questions were available for you to ask, right? Why we should be asking questions, why it's important, how to like look at the world through a certain prism. He was very accepting, as you can understand. He was always asking a question around people, which is why I think we had these kind of variety of different people always kind of coming in. He was very clear at the time. He was like, we would come to the States. We have to find a place to kind of live amongst the people that we've come to be with, right? We don't want to live like alone or on so we want to keep asking questions. So all the time um, he, and he would do, I think exactly as you described, kind of had like a, a hand, a presence kind of behind me. I mean, in some ways, you know, they, there's a really nice saying, an American Indian saying was like that, that there's, we, we have two deaths, right? One death is the physical death we have, the body has. And then the second death is when you are, um, when the last person you ever knew stops remembering you or something like, I'm butchering the, the right. quote, but yeah. it's something yeah. like that. And I, yeah. and in, in a sense, it's funny, my cousin, uh, you know, he was very close to my father. He still remembers my father very well. My kids still do, even though they were, you know, they were very young when, when he died. But I would say that he kind of gave us a framework uh, in our family of how to think and how to feel, how to approach the world, you know, and in a, in a very um, non-judgmental way. I think that's the, really the most important thing I ever kind of like acquired from it was like to, to look at the world in some ways, w without any judgment, and then to 
decide where you fit in that or what you wanted for yourself and the choices that were available for yourself. I think, uh, yeah. And his and that, death, and that, by the way, was a beautiful thing. I mean, he died. Um, I had just kind of like, I was doing a play on Broadway. Uh, my mother and my father had just celebrated their 50th anniversary. Uh, everyone was together in New York kind of celebrating it. There, there was a completeness in, in some ways. And, and he he kind of had the death that I wish I would have, I, I'm hoping for, in that he yeah. slipped away. He just slipped away. Yeah. And honestly, when you when you hear about illnesses or things that some people can face in their final stages, I think that is that is all we can kind of wish for in the final stages. Or kind of go, please just let let's please. go go quickly and quietly and without pain and 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 all that and and a nice transition if you want to call it uh, call yeah. it that as well. So, um, but how um how kind of um forward thinking of him really? Because you're saying effectively what he's saying is is being in the now looking at the situation around you, reacting to it, asking questions about it, working out how you fit into it, not you must have a predetermined path and you are this and you know, you're, and having a, you know, a set of, uh, I suppose, pre-written rules is kind of going, no, work it out because it's changing all yeah. the time. And his, his world would have changed from the pin to it to America. Absolutely. And there was that, that tension in him as well. I know that he very much wanted to, uh, uh, you know, he had a, he had a predetermined idea of how he wanted me to turn out for sure. Absolutely. What he might have, what his choices were. So I saw him wrestling with that tension. He and I wrestled with that tension between us as well. So it was interesting to watch someone, you know, your parent or, or someone kind of like uh, uh, learning. I, I tell you what I really admire. I admired his uh, capacity for growth. Like the ability, my mom is also similar, like the, the ability to kind of take new information and make decisions based on that new information as new information kind of comes into your circle to alter to you know to change tack to alter your course in what way in, 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 a, in a business way and in a self-improvement way in a in a what how, how, i would say both, both really and i would say especially like a personal emotional way so you know when he came to the states he had a very kind of you know obviously you come to the states my uncle we came because my uncle at the time um he had studied uh agro he'd done a phd in agronomy at the U university of kansas he started working for the state department the state department at that time was getting involved in third world countries developing commercial farming systems part of one of the benefits of course working for the state department like would you like to have someone kind of come to the states my dad said i, I think i would he was older at this point he was in his late 30s so he kind of like he was fully you know he was a grown man um and, uh, uh, you know, so I think when he came out to the States, it was with the idea that my children will kind of study one of the things that I, I would have liked to have done. Obviously a doctor or a lawyer or something like all of these things, you know, that were kind of laid out. But when I started, and, and at some point I was kind of going on that track, I played, but I played baseball, uh, which kind of befuddled him a little bit. He was like, why would you do that? I was like, you can, you can do this. Cause at one point I had like an ambition wildly speculative but i wanted to become a professional baseball player it was never going to happen but it was a nice dream yeah <laughs> why not why not and then, it could happen oh, could oh happen. i was too small i was tiny i was like too small and too, oh. i didn't have any clue you know like okay. you know, like yeah. there were there were kids out there whose dads were training them every weekend and my dad was like what what's this <laughs> Forty for kid me. Look, we left the yes. you hold you it? Oh, I, I got a game. He's like, why? Why are you going to play games? It's like, well, hang on now. Uh, yeah. And then, okay. and then you know, when I went to university, I went to Berkeley and all that kind of stuff, and I kind of started understanding and seeing the world in a wider perspective. It wasn't really anything that he was um, had been exposed to or familiar with, but he he went with it. He just kind of went with it. And like I say, it took him a while to understand that the the, the the, the reorienting of his goals for me into understanding what were my goals for me. Yeah. So, so I know it's a bit of a cliche question because you said about the doctor lawyer thing. And, mm -hmm. and I just want to add that, you know, some people will hear this and particularly if they're non-Asian, they will kind of go, Oh, typical story, you know, Indian parent wants you to be a doctor lawyer that I always think you've got to remember that comes from wanting the best. That's all the doctor lawyer thing is. Dr. Lawyer can is just basically saying, don't struggle like we did. Don't, you know, we, they, they're looking around their world. They're seeing doctors, lawyers, accountants, whatever, making money, be, doing well for themselves. And so all, when they say that, they don't, they don't know about, oh, uh, you know, a top baseball player will be earning $200,000 a week. They don't know that. So they can't relate to that. So that's all doctors. Well, right. Means. And I think also, too, like, you know, it's, context is everything. 
And you, you have to kind of consider like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, around that time, baseball sports figures weren't making the kind of money they're making now. Actors right. and actresses weren't making the kind of money that's possible now. If you're like at the very top band, uh, business was not was not creamy. There, there weren't billionaires as such. No, no. A doctor and lawyer represented uh, the pinnacle of everything that was achievable really within society. It was the nexus. It wasn't all money based. It was the nexus between education, um, community service, uh, financial reward. Yep. And, and so it, it, it represented like the, the, the top of the social tree in every way, in every single way. Like, you know, in the 70s, if you were a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, you weren't just like now there's a millions and millions of them. Right. Of course. Like, like everything, like in everything. Yeah. It wasn't quite like that. So, so the, 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 it, it was the the equivalent of potentially in, in your locality, in your little town or city, wherever you were, of being like kind of an athlete of prominence in some way, shape or form. Now, of course, you know, prominence is conferred on us by YouTube or, yeah. uh, you know, what, whatever, whatever the new, uh, 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 whatever the new currency is, you know, ath ath you know, athletics, uh, Jeff Bezos. I mean, Jeff Bezos has a, a conception of money that, that I don't even think existed in that, in that period of time. No. No, yeah. you can't fathom it. Um, but then in that way, I think what you've done is exactly what he probably would have wanted, which is look around, see what's going on and adapt to it. And at some point you've gone, hang on a minute, characters, acting, roles, scripts. I can do this and I can do this well. This is my doctorate. This is my, you know, legal Pass whatever. So mm. when when does that happen in you? When do you kind of go? This is me. I am. I am pursuing acting, because that that takes balls. That's as ballsy as saying I'm going to become a baseball player. Yeah, um, and you had to be just about just, about just as ignorant, which I was. Um, <laughs> I was going to. Uh, I was a total idiot. I mean, I'm like not an idiot, but I just did. I didn't know what I was getting involved in. I I, I had another idea that was kind of festering underneath me which took years to kind of figure out what it was. You know, I was going to university. I was at Berkeley. Um, I was like about to graduate. Uh, and you have to take like a meeting with your TA. And he at one point says, or your, your advisor rather. And he said, uh, you know, when do you, what, what is your art credit going to be? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you can't graduate without having an art credit. I was like, well, what does that mean? He's like, well, you like sculpting or, you know, painting or acting or dance or music. Do you play an instrument? No. Do you, well, do, do you have any experience in dance? No. Do you paint? Like, no. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Anyway, on and on and on. And Berkeley at that point, it still is very much this way, but it was very competitive to kind of get, to even get into classes was competitive in any event. Uh, the only option at one point was to have the, the, you know, the choice to kind of go and audition for something, which I did, which was, Great. I happened to get into the class and that started a process of like, I don't know, self-actualizing, like kind of seeing like who I was like, I, okay. So I had a vision of my, like we all do. I had a vision of myself as like a sentient operating human being in the world. Right. Totally independent of my color, totally independent. I didn't see, like, I don't look at myself like, Oh, look, there's Harry Dillon that look at that Brown guy. <laughs> or look at that. I just had a concept. It wasn't until I started acting that I realized like, Oh, wait a minute there's another aspect to this that people do when they see me particularly at this time and still even to this day they see the color of who i am this is all part of their picture it's feeding into their biases well who's in who's representing this in this world like where does the voice of let's say this guy come out or you know or an, an, an indian woman or a young indian actress or actor or anything like that there was there was nothing like that so that became really interesting to me yeah um perceptions you see, and again, that's where you become the, the narrator, the, the voyeur, the whatever to the world where you're suddenly looking at everything around you. And you're, you again, I think that comes from your dad from what exactly what you said, taking information, adapt to your surroundings. That's, that is the actor's advice. If you'd give, to give any advice to any actor, he said, read the script, soak up the information, read around the role and adapt accordingly. Your, yeah, your dad, dad was, your dad always trained you to be an actor. Oh, uh, surely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think probably. <laughs> thank God he's dead. He wouldn't want to hear you say that. No, <laughs> no I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and it's, uh, you know, obviously now, like when I went, to, I came here to go to drama school. And so you kind of have, you know, I went to Berkeley, I went to drama school, you know, I, 
you know, in England, right? It was like the pinnacle, particularly if you're American, right? These are all kind of like uh, uh, iconic institutions of, you know, some kind of learning, and particularly back then, whatever we might think of them now. I don't even know that it's right, but in any event. And then you leave, and then you kind of get, you know, offered, you know, like the, uh, uh, the part you kind of get offered is purely based on the optics, purely on the optics. And so it becomes things like whatever, all the roles you don't, uh, uh, what I call beta characters, not alpha. If you were brown at that point, you couldn't play an alpha character. You could only play beta, right? Yeah. The narrative never centered around you. Now, whatever those might be, if there was a narrative story that involves someone who was brown or even black back then or anything like that, it was, it was only in a secondary or even tertiary role. And, uh, and you were never allowed at any moment in which to be alpha to kind of like express that very thing. So that became another thing that be was like very interesting. Now that is obviously changing right now, but it's just, start but I'm not saying it started changing in 2014. I mean, it started changing in 2020, Yeah. 19. I mean, that's my joke all the time. I'll read a script sometime. I'm like, what the hell is this? What do you think this is? 2018? Yeah. <laughs> how, how archaic is this? Well, yeah, it's written chalk, chalk and crayons. It's like, what is, yeah. what is that? Right. Yeah. So, so I think that's that's a, that's a very interesting thing that 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 I had kind of noticed and naively thinking that that because I thought that you you want to kind of like bust through a barrier, like like some kind of story. Like for me, I was a guy who's who had grown up in the states and had as much of an American upbringing as Todd, let's say, yeah. or whoever. Yeah. Yeah, like that. Uh, and and what now? Then, so now that if you feel that change is coming, and and by the way, don't you feel um, that the BLM movement helped? It helps all of us of any color because that it was that I felt that was the shift that made everyone kind of go, "Whoa, let's stop. This is not. This is all been a certain way." And I don't know, did the because you're also because of the timing and the way you're framing it, 2019, 2020, that was also the the big the big BLM totally. time. I think there were two kind of movements particularly that kind of like started opening the, the doors of perception. One was the um, the hashtag Me Too movement. For whatever we might think of the movement, right? There's no doubt that it had so something that you obviously, the George Floyd, the BLM movement. Although for whatever reason, you know, it's not like there were incidences. It's George, the, the, the incident of George Floyd was not the first, wasn't the 10th, wasn't the 100th, wasn't the 10,000th probably wasn't even a million on both black, brown, you know, what, 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 whoever you want to like uh, yeah, uh, uh, call other, right? Male, female, whatever. I think that it, my little pet theory, be interesting to hear what you say, is that the reason it kind of caught wind at that point in time is not because we were culturally advanced, it's because the world had stopped. We were just sitting in here. There was no sport. There was no distraction. There's no sport. There's no. Uh, 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 there's no theater. There's no noise. There's no. There's no noise. Literally, I mean, I would take my kids out. To, we would cycle around the streets of London. They'd be like, "Can we do this?" I'm like, "You guys, this is actually a really beautiful thing that's happening. This will never happen again in our lifetime. Where I don't think <laughs> where we yeah. can cycle across London." There's not a car. There's not a person. There's it, it's unimpeded. It's silent. And I think that something like the George Floyd uh, incident that, that happened kind of took hold because the world was completely quiet at that moment. Yeah. Um, I agree. And this is a, t a weird example, a, a, a weird way of echoing that. It's always around Christmas time and around the Christmas week of Christmas and New Year that things go viral in our community online because people are sitting around at home here we go forwarding on watching sharing and it'll be something you know something embarrassing video about someone or something that brought shame to somebody else or some you know naughty mm -hmm. tape or whatever but that's and I've, I've seen it for about four or five years now i'm like it's always that week it's always that because there's no noise because there's less going on because we're not whizzing around so you're right timing and, and all that's come together and it's kind of made it was it's brought us to where we are and now post covid post lockdown all that to change in society change shift what does this mean what is it how do you how do you process that as an actor when you talk about back to your dad's lesson of taking in the information okay this is what's happened where do you go now with your roles what are you saying to your agent 
you know, what are you, what conversations are you having on a, on a practical business level? I'm thinking about, you know, the use, the, 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 the way podcasts and listening is affected by the fact that people aren't traveling. People aren't on the commute. It's affected my business like that. I do stand up comedy. It's affected the numbers coming to the room, but people are coming back now. I can feel the bounce yeah. back and the bounce back stronger. Um, so what, what now for you is, I suppose what I'm saying, where are you going with this? I mean, it's interesting. You know, I, I kind of like, I'm a little bit older now, right? So my kind of need to kind of go back into the circus is not so great. <laughs> so, like, and my kids are growing up a little bit. Like, I've kind of done some stuff where I like, I, I've kind of had the good fortune, like, you know, Holby City, when I kind of came in, like, talk about being an alpha character. It was the opportunity to play an alpha character, right? Like, like at that time to come into England and do something like that, for me, particularly, it was unheard of, you know, doing the play on Broadway that, that was written by Ayad Akhtar, which was, you know, centered around a Muslim American lawyer. Again, at the time, like people, like if that play were going on now, I think people would just have accepted the optics of the play. It was a play, and I remember we got picked up, it was a play with a Muslim American lawyer, a black American lawyer, a her Jewish uh, art dealer husband, and yeah. uh, my character's white, uh, uh, white wasp wife. And people were like, how could those people ever be sitting in a room together having dinner? Like that was the level of discussion. I was like, what, what are you talking about? Now, I think that something like that would be just taken on board. For me, what, what, it's, what it's really about now is kind of getting involved in uh, stories or things that I, I want to tell from a different perspective. So whether it's acting, whether it's producing, I've just kind of gotten involved, actually pre-pandemic, got involved with uh, the producers who produced the play I did on Broadway. Uh, we're doing The Outsiders, which was a novel and a yeah. film, which very famously starred, uh, I mean, in the early 80s, it's uh, uh, Matt Dillon, Tom Cruise, Patrick Swayze, Diane Lane, C. Thomas Howe, Ralph Macchio. I'm forgetting something goes on and on and on. Did I say Matt Dillon? So, and and yeah. turning that into a musical uh, alongside um, uh, 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 Francis Ford Coppola's film production company, American Zoetrope. Wow. Wow. So I'm working as an associate producer. I'm, I'm low man on the totem pole there. I'm not <laughs> making any decisions, you know. Like I'm not making any decisions. A couple here and there. But one of the ones I got to do, and this was, we started pre-pandemic. I was like, wait a minute, The Outsiders, which is a novel that's set in uh, 1960s Oklahoma, is about two uh, uh, between the haves and the have-nots. Two groups of like you know the the poor uh, the poor white kids versus the rich white kids, right? It's kind of a um, it's almost like a Romeo and Juliet story. Um, and I was like, well, we clearly can't. Well, how are we going to cast this thing? And I could see them taking on board what I was saying, but I could also feel like the tension within them a little bit. Like, well, this is set in like the you know, in the 60s in Oklahoma. I was like, yeah, yeah, but it's not playing in 1960s Oklahoma. And this is a musical. By the way, the reality on stage is whatever we say it is. Anyway, yep. during the pandemic, the casting is moving in a way that that is that is reflective of the world that we're kind of that we're kind of in. So that's kind of more interesting to me now. I mean, I don't know, Tommy, anymore. Like I have like the desire. I mean, it's got to be a really special project for me to kind of like think, OK, I want to stand on stage every night for, you know, six weeks to nine months and doing this every night. It's like it's got to mean something it had like it has to kind of fit within my personal architecture. Yeah. Um, in some ways, same with television and same with, you know, I, I spend more time probably either doing things that are, uh, believe it or not, shorter <laughs> or um, that that are that are kind of interesting. You're like I'll kind of like most of the stuff I'll say, you know, no to in essence. Yes. Yeah. So great. Harry Dillon's become childlike in his uh, later years. He's just he's become stubborn, little moody child. Unless it's interesting, unless it's fun for me, unless it fits what I want to do, I'm not saying no. I'm not playing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> hey, why not? Why not? I think you, you've earned the right to uh, to pick and choose. So, uh, listen, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the chat. Um, I feel like there's probably a billion more things we could talk about from the acting world to everything to where it's all going but 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 just good luck with it all and you know i've always Thank been an admirer from afar and um we haven't got to have this kind of conversation ever so um it, well i really appreciate it no, thank you. Th thanks really for being thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and having me on and like experiencing yeah. this format. I, you know, thank you, yeah. coronavirus, for things like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at how very now we turn very Asian. No, thank you. Tada, apna, tada, bo, tada, 
proper traditional right completely look look after yourself and, and all the love to the family and uh, keep doing what you're doing we'll see you very very Likewise. soon all right all love to you thank and your you. family take it easy thank you man thank you. wait 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 before you go i need to ask you to make sure you have hit the subscribe button and you are listening to these podcasts regularly so if they're on youtube if you're watching this now Huh? Lucky you. You get to see my face uh, as well as hear the voice. Um, please do hit the bell button and, and hit the subscribe thing and get involved with the whole channel so you can stay up to date with what's going on. It really does make a difference for us. We then know where our subscribers are, the kind of episodes you're listening to, and then I can give you more of that kind of stuff, more of the good stuff. You want more good stuff? Hit subscribe to this podcast right now and follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Just go find the Tommy Sander podcast and welcome it into your life.